do here at Casa Esperanza National Latino Network. As Wendy mentioned, I'm joined by Lumari Orozco. Lumari, you want to say hi? Yeah, good, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here and happy that you've been able to join us today. So thank you. Look forward to speaking with you all today. And so um, this is the Q&A portion of the webinar series. It's very conversational. We do have a couple of slides we're going to go through. Um, we're going to do some recapping and then pause for some question and answers. And then we'll provide some frequently asked questions toward the end. But please feel free to um, interject um, as we go along. So again, this is very conversational. And as things come up for folks, please um, let us know. And then if people can indulge me just for a quick second, um, just wanted to get a sense of who's here. For those of you who are here with us today, if you can type in the chat box, how many of you participated in all or both of the previous webinars? If y'all can just let us know, that'd be great. Um, awesome. All right. So um, seems like folks may have missed one or two or what have you. Well, that's fine. Um, um, you will have the recordings um, that Tasa has archived on, on their own website or their YouTube channel or whatever platform that they have. Um, and again, as always, you're definitely welcome to reach out to us in case you need more further training and technical assistance on this issue. So just to go ahead and get started, um, so just a quick reminder, Casa Esperanza, um, we are located in St. Paul, Minnesota, and um, we've been, Casa Esperanza has been doing this work around ending gender-based violence, domestic violence, sexual assault since 1982. Um, and you can see based on the web, or on the web, on the screen, that we have different focus areas around the work that we do. We firmly believe that in the mission that by mobilizing, in this case, Latino communities or communities in general, um, really ending these forms of gender-based violence, sexual assault, domestic violence, and so on. And it's about also emphasizing um, the development of social capital, trust, reciprocity, information, and cooperation. Because again, we do believe that it is in the hands of community that the community will end this form of gender-based violence that diverse communities are impacted by. As part of that, over the years, Casa Esperanza uh, was recognized based on our community engagement at work approach to ending gender-based violence. Um, in 2011, we received our first national training and TA grant from the Office of Violence Against Women. And as part of that, we've grown. Now there's at least between 15 to 12 members of the national project and we're scattered all over the country three of us here in the state of texas um, including myself and Gumari, who are here today presenting the webinar and then we have folks in puerto rico boston reno california dc atlanta idaho um and the rest of the teams are the team is located at home base which is St. Paul, minnesota and of course, our three main goals are work around public policy, research and training and technical assistance. And again, all, all these three tenants are based on community engagement principles, culture responsive principles around public policy, research and training and technical, training and technical assistance, which again, um, people are welcome to engage with us in case they need further training and technical assistance, not just around language access, but we do hold diverse forms of training and technical assistance as well. Um, just to recap, just want to ask a question, and if folks can type in the chat box, um, just what is the definition of limited English proficiency? So we want to make this as engaging as possible, as interactive as possible. So. For folks, even if you weren't part of the webinars or attended one or the other, we can just go ahead and just type um, what is how, what is the definition in your mind of limited English proficiency or someone who is, may, identif may be identified as limited English proficiency, proficient. So if folks can type that in the chat box, that would be great. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. I just want to get a sense of 
knowledge out there. When English is your second language. So thank you, Samira, for sharing that. Um, and yes, that is correct. Um, so someone who's identified as limit English proficient is our individuals with uh, who do not speak English as their primary language and have a limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English. Um, so again, thank you for that, for sharing. Um, so again, again, this is part of the recap just to make sure we're all having understanding of the language or terminology. Another question as far as recap is, how would you summarize the importance of providing language access? Um, so if folks could either type in the chat box, there are your responses, how would you summarize the importance of providing language access? Again, what, whether you participate in the webinars or not, what is your instinct? What does your instinct tell you as the response would be to this question? Um, extremely important. Survivors need to know their options. Yes. Um, provide equity when you provide language access. Uh, the level the to level the playing field. Correct. And I think just like anything, particularly um, particularly around those of us who provide life-saving services, which I do consider that those of us who work at crisis centers, working with survivors of sexual assault or, se or sexual violence, we I'm sorry. Um I'm sorry. Hello. Can y'all hear me? I think I was cut off there for a minute. Um, so as I was saying, um, I truly believe that the services we provide at the crisis centers is life-saving uh, services. And so it's so vital that we are able to communicate the various options, recourses, and resources that survivors of sexual assault may have or may, may have gain access to. So that's so important. And so, um, okay. again, the, the, yes, Wendy? I'm going to interrupt for a moment. That little momentary glitch of where nobody could hear was my bad. I was trying to unmute, unmute everyone. And in the process, I, I mean, yeah, I muted everyone, including me. Um, we are a small group. So I have just unmuted everyone. So if you want to speak up and ask a question or answer the questions orally, Please do so, because I know it takes a moment or two to type. So thank you for letting me jump in here. It's back to you. Thank you, Wendy. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, yes. And so um, just, again, the, the answer to the question is, any individual with limited English proficient is not denied the opportunity to access and obtain the, the services support and support necessary for their safety and well-being as a result of language barriers. And again, also being mindful of that it's not just about being able to communicate in a spoken language, but also being having accessibility for individuals that use diverse forms of communication. For example, folks who are who may identify as part of the deaf and hard of hearing community, they are they use diverse forms of diverse forms of communication. So just being mindful of that as well. And also um, when we do anything in writing, brochures, websites, anything that folks will engage through written material or websites, make sure that it's written in plain English, because sometimes we often get we get uh, caught up in our own professional jargon. And for those of us who've been advocates with survivors for a while, we have to break down those acronyms, those abbreviations, and often. We also have to do that approach around plain English within, profes within professional circles. Because um, if I'm talking to someone outside of the criminal justice field, let's say law enforcement or prosecution, and I'm talking to someone in the community-based social services, and I'm telling them, I have a survivor here, someone that needs your services, they, they have a PO and a SAPSER, 
does that make sense? Would that make sense to anybody um, that I'm trying to connect the survivor with that, that provides additional services? And so that might, people may draw a blank around that. They may not understand that. So again, it's just being able to make sure that when we are engaging or interfacing with survivors that may have limited English proficiency, it's not just about translating spoken language, but also making, being cognizant of folks who use diverse forms of communication and keeping it, keeping it at a level of understanding for everybody, um, and which means also minimizing using jargon, professional jargon such as acronyms and abbreviations. Would anyone else like to add to this uh, piece of the recap? Does that make sense for folks? Um, you can type it in the chat box or you can cer certainly um, engage. But I just, you know, again, just a reminder for, for that. Lamadi, anything else to add to this? No, I think you gave a pretty comprehensive example. Thank you. Um, so moving forward, another part of the recap. So if someone could um, define what meaningful access is for for individuals who identify as limited English proficient, so if you can you can either type it. Or if you'd like to chime in, would someone like to share what or define for us what does meaningful access mean for limited English proficient individuals? And I also believe in the Socratic method, so don't make me <laughs> call people out. So I, I know Holly is on the phone. So Holly, would you like to share, <laughs> define this for us? Hi, sorry, I had food in my mouth and I could type, but my hands have stuff on them. So, <clears throat> can you all hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. I was, I was thinking what you said before, like not just having um, materials written or not just having people who um, speak multiple languages, but having um, just a wide variety of ways to make sure people have actual access, not just someone who maybe um, is you know, a random interpreter that, you know, can't effectively do that, but multiple ways to access it, I guess, is what kind of comes to mind, if that makes any sense. Perfect. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Samira, Belinda, Samira? Who is this? This is Lumadi. I just wanted to say something really quickly just to add to what Holly said. It's also about when we talk about meaningful access, it's really looking at what is feasible for each individual organization. Um, because when we talk about meaningful access, it's really looking at, you know, what are we currently providing um, and where can we get to in the future? So kind of really looking at um, what is the floor to ceiling for some organizations, for example, if you're a, a smaller um rural organization with a small budget, you know, what's meaningful for you in terms of language access might be different than for a larger urban-based organization with a larger budget. So meaningful access really is about not only what Holly explained about ensuring that you're, you know, uh, providing different types of access, but it's also looking at, you know, what can the organization provide without putting too much burden on the organization per se. Thank you, Amadi. And um, anyone else would like to share? Um, and again, at, at the core of it, it's, we kind of break it down into three areas. It's the right thing to do. Language access improves services and enhances outcomes, and it's a legal requirement. And so we use this, this three-prong approach because for some of us, the right thing to do has more meaning. Uh, for some of us, you know, we're process oriented and we know that if we, we provide language access to everybody that everyone gets enhances the services at, at all levels. And also for some of us, it's also a legal requirement. It is a legal requirement. So making sure that we're not in violation and we are, our organizations are in compliance of what we are, what we are required to do legally and what are those expectations. Um, and again, the, the word, like Lamadi said, it's meaningful access and working with what you've got. So I also want to um, confirm that our approach at Casa Esperanza really is about working with individual organizations and working with the resources that they have. 
and that's making sure that they are connected to other community uh, members who may are who may have that um, cultural expertise um, around navigating certain issues around language access. And so, a lot of things. One of the things that we like to we emphasize at Casa Esperanza is co-advocacy. And certainly, Casa Esperanza is not <laughs> perfect around these areas. It is also we are also constantly trying to improve in our areas around co-advocacy and also understanding that we want, we want to do the right thing. We want to make sure that that when providing access to language access, improved services, enhances outcomes, and also being in compliance. But also that means that going outside of our organization and making those connections with our peers, um, with our community as well, and see what those resources are. And often when you think you don't have resources, you have a lot of resources. It just means that having to step out of your offices, our offices, and going and, and having conversations with community. And I understand, you know, we, we work at crisis centers. We, we focus on crisis intervention a lot. But part of our goal and, and having been in the front lines is making sure that the success of our, our advocacy with survivors of sexual assault really relies on our collaborations outside of the organization. We may have great programming as part of the crisis center, but it means nothing if folks outside of our organization does not rise to the same level of practice around meaningful access, regardless, you're, regardless of whether you're talking about survivors with limited English proficiency or, you, or use of response of communication or whatever other form of access issue that the survivor may encounter. And this is something you can apply to anything that you do beyond just language access in your organization. So Juan, wow. I want to jump in really quick. Samira had a question. Yes. Can you go back to the previous slide? So Samira had asked, how sure are we that it is a legal requirement? So um, it is a legal requirement by both um, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and also the executive ordered 13166. So under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, um, any organization that receives federal financial assistance, either directly or indirectly, is required to comply. And that means that when an organization receives any federal funds, that all aspects of that particular organization is obligated to take reasonable steps to ensure that individuals with limited English with limited English proficiency, have meaningful access to the benefits and services provided by that organization. And where it comes into play is that under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, it states that no person in the United States shall, on the ground of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to the discrimination under any program or activity that's receiving federal financial assistance. And what we're looking at here in this definition is we're looking at the key term national origin because language falls under that category. So based on someone's national origin or the language they speak, uh, we're, not, we're not able to discriminate um, against any individual because of that. Right, so because of that, we are bound by the Civil Rights Act to be able, Title VI of the Civil, Civil Rights Act, to be able to provide um, meaningful language access. Whereas um, the Executive Order 13166 is an, it's a federal requirement which um, orders and requires federal agencies and recipients of federal monies um, to be able to um, look at their internal practices and create um, access to those services that they provide. So 13166 actually requires every organization that receives federal funding to actually have a written language access policy in place. And what we find through the work that Jose Huang and I do is that when we talk to individuals about whether or not they have an existing language access plan, oftentimes what folks describe are current language access practices. So for example, you know, we'll, we'll ask individuals and they'll say, oh, we have access to a telephonic interpretation line via the language line. 
or we have um, bilingual, bicultural staff, or, you know, we've taken steps to translate some of our materials into Spanish because it's a commonly spoken language in that area. And so when we talk about legal requirements, um, it's, it's challenging, but the thing is, is that it is covered under Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and then, um, it's expected or the expectation has been set under the Executive Order 13166, which does require that any program um, that receives any amount uh, of federal funding comply by having a language access plan and by providing meaningful language access. And that means, for example, if you're a larger, if you're a sexual assault program, for example, within a much larger social service agency, the fact that your program receives federal funding by default requires that entire organization to have both a language access plan in place and to provide meaningful language access within that organization, not just that program. And I think it's really important for us um, to know or be um, informed or just aware of Title VI because, um, you know, it is something that, that could come back um and impact um our work and um our possibly our funding so oftentimes you know what we hear is that folks will say you know we know the title six we're covered you know we have to abide by title six but we don't have any funding uh, available to provide language access and so the expectation of the federal government is once you receive any award from the federal government whether it's directly from the Office of Violence Against Women, whether it's through your state administrator or through your state coalition, the expectation is that once you've received those monies, that you will automatically allocate some of those monies to language access um, services, whether that's setting aside, you know, $500 in your budget to be able to provide some interpretation services or to be able to, um, you know, um, translate some documents if needed. If you're a much larger organization, clearly you can then, you know, set aside, you know, larger amounts of money. But when I was talking about earlier about that meaningful access or taking reasonable steps, um, the government or the federal government um, does understand that the reality for many organizations is that, you know, there's only so much that we can do. But the expectation is, is that we're going to take steps to provide that access. Again, so it's really looking at, you know, the floor to the ceiling. If right now as an organization, all you can do is, you know, hire a bilingual staff member, that's taking reasonable steps to providing meaningful language access for you and your organization. Um, and hopefully that's not putting an undue burden on an organization. Um, and what the goal of the language access plan is, again, is to look at what you're currently doing and figuring out, you know, what can we be doing in six months? So for the organization that currently right now has a bilingual staff member who's, you know, who's a translator and the interpreter and the applicant and all of that, you know, is looking at where can we be in six months? Is there an opportunity for us to contract either with a language line or can we access the language line to the state coalition? Or can we reach out, like Jose Juan said, you know, looking at other culturally specific community-based organizations in your area who you might be able to contract with to be able to provide some services and or looking at other um, agencies um, within the state who might have access to a language line who might be willing to provide you with access to the language line as well. And we've seen this happen in many states where organizations will contract with each other to utilize each other's language access lines, right? So again, it really is about looking at what you can, what you're currently doing um, and what you can do um, over the next six months, over the next 12 months, over the next 18 months, so that you continue to build on the um, access that you're providing and what that looks like. And again, um, the intent of this all is really to increase access to safety and increase parity in services to ensure that individuals with limited English proficiency do have access to those life-saving services that we all provide. It's not created or intended to provide an undue burden or put an undue burden on any organization.
education. So that's why it's so important for you all to consider or think about, you know, developing a language access plan and putting that into place because it really helps you to um, formalize those practices that you have in place. Also provides you the opportunities to look at where you can be in the future, looking at what resources are needed to get you there. You know, I have conversations with, you know, your finance folks to see, you know, if currently all we can set aside is $250 for language access services, you know, for this year, what can we set aside for next year? And if our current budget doesn't allow for that, then how do we fundraise or how do we um, identify other sources of funding that'll help us increase language access services over the long run? Um, so that's kind of, you know, and so that's kind of what we're trying to do here. And again, both of those federal requirements are in place. Um, and it's critical that we try to, as much as we can, to ad um, adhere to those, that um, we take them seriously because, you know, we've seen a, in a couple of states where um, there have been instances where organizations have not prioritized language access services. And what happens is that, you know, survivors or victims are turned away and aren't able to access services. And complaints have been filed with the Department of Justice. There's a, a complaint process um, that's available for folks who are denied services um, based on language issues. And um, those um, complaints are investigated by DOJ. And, you know, sanctions will be issued um, to an organization, um, sanctions that you have to adhere to and abide by. And, you know, and it could potentially put in risk any federal funding that you're currently receiving. So to Jose Juan's point, it's not only the right thing to do in terms of, you know, we're in this work to save lives and to provide the best services possible, but it also is that legal requirement piece that we're, um, that we need to abide by. And I think that this legal requirement piece also is one of those tools that we have in our back pocket um, when we're either trying to get buy-in from others in our organizations to see the importance of us um, institutionalizing our language access practices through a language access plan, or, you know, when we run into situations where um, other service providers that we're working with or the courts, for example, aren't providing adequate language access services, we're able to, you know, pull out that tool and say, you know, the Civil Rights Act, Title VI, State VI, the executive order 13166 states this, and therefore it also becomes a way of us being able to advocate uh, for survivors in situations where meaningful language access services aren't being provided. Thank you, Lumadi. And we do have, uh, um, we also have developed another toolkit specifically to engage courts around language access, which is accessible on our website, and we'll definitely share a copy, we'll send a copy of that to TASA so they can share with you all. Um, it's a whole different webinar, but there are some ways, and, and uh, through the toolkit, some ways of identifying um, opportunities for engagement with court systems around language access and developing their own language access plan as well. So that, that there is that option, or there is that ability as well. Um, yeah, and just really quick, Jose, I want to Samira's point, you know, the toolkit itself also provides, so the toolkit was developed um, as a result of a survey, a national survey that we did with advocates across the country, both domestic violence advocates and sexual assault advocates, based on the challenges that advocates were facing in um, holding courts accountable in providing language access services, because what we see oftentimes, like Samira mentioned, is that um, that you know oftentimes um, even you know she said she talked about rural county courts, but even urban county urban um, courts or civil courts, criminal courts, I'm finding are also hesitant oftentimes to provide uh, language access services. So again, the toolkit, the course toolkit, is a, is a is a tool itself again to help advocates hold courts accountable. And it does take you through the process of, you know, talking to the court, um, instructing the court on what their um, responsibilities are, and, you know, helping you to figure out what actions need to be taken as a result to ensure that you're able to um, obtain language access services for any survivors um, or victims that you are, um, that you're accompanying to court. Thank you, Marty. Anything else 
folks would like to share specifically around meaningful access or more questions. Um, we do appreciate people's engagement. Um, and I also want to add at this time, this is exactly why these webinar, this webinar series has been hosted. It is important, and y'all are considered to be national experts. So I encourage everyone to use you, Casa de Esperanza, and particularly Jose Juan and Lumari as resources. They're, that's what you know. That's what they do. So please, please, please use them. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate that. Um, so we're going to move on. Um, so. Um, I want to pause here for a moment. Uh, we've kind of gotten a lot of information. And um, for those of you who participated in the previous webinars, or if this is like the first time, I um, just want to give a moment for folks who may have questions of, to discuss what we've discussed so far, or anything that's come up while we were sharing information up to this point. So if folks would like to chime in or just type their questions in the chat box, it's also welcome. Okay. Again, I'm going to remind people, y'all are unmuted so we can hear what's going on in your uh, immediately surrounding you and just chime in and talk. We're a small group today, so that's what we're doing. So, um, yes. Well, maybe you need to repeat the question since I jumped in over you. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem, Wendy. Again, um, has any questions come up for folks based on what we've shared so far? Again, whether you've participated in the webinars previous or not, um, I mean, please, uh, certainly uh, when I started to learn about language access, I had a lot of questions, and I still do, because every community is different and every resource in every community is, are different. So just, again, if folks have any questions, want to take a moment here for folks to either type in the chat box or just chime in um, if you're able. If not, um, we're going to go ahead and move on. So these are the some of the questions, some of the frequently asked questions that um, we've kind of gotten over the years presenting around language access. Um, since And these are some questions that you may have, is what is the best place to get started? So so I'm going to pose this question to you all. So what is what do you all think is the best place to get started? You know, you want to type in your answers in the chat box or just chime in. Um, what is what are what is the best place to get started around language access or starting to think about developing your language access plan? What are folks thinking? So folks are saying your your local community, uh, creating a plan itself with community partners. Yes, within the agency, assessing our current practice. Yes, all of that. So there's so a lot of it is very introspective work at the beginning, right? And making sure, w assessing the entire organization and what does the entire organization think about having language access as a priority to making their services overall accessible to everybody in their community. Right, so, it, so at the beginning, it's just a lot of introspective work that needs to happen. And this is also another area where Casa Esperanza has done a lot of technical assistance on. Um, we've been invited to go into organizations and um, just ask questions, and we are currently revamping our organizational assessment tool. Um, and Lamai, you can probably can talk more about this, but it's basically a very comprehensive questionnaire that we administer to um, the staff or the staff of the organization. It, the entire process is at about six months, and we ask different questions, and it's got different categories of sub-questions to the survey, and then we bring in folks together and we discuss the results, and it really is about having courageous conversations, to, not to be too, um, um, too hokey about it, but it, it really does require where when you get started, it's about having these internal conversations as an organization. So where do we stand and how do we stand around language access and so on? How do you prioritize the first steps? This is another question. So 
some of you started by assessing the current practice, so, but where where do you prioritize these first steps? So I'm just so again, if folks could share their um, their responses on the chat box, or you know, if you want to chime in, how do you prioritize these first steps? What do you all think? Um, so you you get started by having internal dialogue. So what would be some of those first steps around? venturing into the planning stages of this. Um, so often we recommend that once you start and have the initial dialogue, um, okay, so they see is saying what is easily attainable, yes. So looking at um, low hanging fruit, for lack of a better statement or phrasing, um, what is it that you already have? What is it that you have within the organization? Or what are some of those community partnerships that you already have that can make, help you all develop a language access plan? Um, um, so yes, looking again, it's, it's also part of this internal assessment of the organization and looking at the strengths of the organization that you already have. Um, training interpreters ourselves, hiring from communities we serve, exactly. Um, and also want to remind folks that um, uh, quite often the composition or the makeup of, of, an, of an organization's uh, staff is made, is composed of community members. Don't forget that also as staff, we are community members. We belong to a diverse form of communities that may be bicultural, bilingual, and also biliterate as well. So looking at, at who is in your organization and prioritizing that. So what would be the first steps around that? Um, how do you get organization and individual buy-in? Um, so Holly said here, gather info and data on what languages in, are represented in the community. Yes, definitely. Um, going out there and, and um, just doing a Google search, as simple as, you know, uh, going to lep.gov, and they can give you that. Going to the census, um, connecting... Um, do you have some? You, do you have anything else? You have um, anything else to add to this? Yeah, just really quick. I'm going to go back to that. How do you prioritize your first steps? Um, I, I would just add that you know one of the first things you'll want to do is kind of do some investigative work to see if your organization currently has a language access plan in place already. Um, oftentimes, we'll find that you know there has there has been a previous language access plan developed by an organization. Um, sometimes folks just aren't aware of it. Sometimes um, organizations haven't had an opportunity to revisit and look at it or review it. Um, so one of the first steps that you'll want to take certainly is looking at um, whether or not your organization has a plan in place. Because if you currently have a plan in place, it's a matter of pulling that plan out, having some conversations with the individual or the individuals involved in the development of that initial plan, just to get your feet um, kind of grounded in some of the work that's been previously done. And then it becomes about looking at that plan to figure out, you know, what um, are some of the things that you have all already mentioned. So looking at, you know, um, what are our current practices? Are they still the same as what we're currently yeah, outlined? And this one is Dr. Plan? Like $5 or something for the paycheck. I'm sorry? Okay. Go ahead. So it's like looking at that current language access plan to see if you have one, um, looking to see what you're currently doing, what needs to be enhanced, what needs to be changed or added, all of that, and or determining whether or not you have a language access plan um, available to you. If you don't have one, then it really is about starting from the very beginning. And part of that very beginning really is about convening a group of like-minded individuals from your organization who are really um, who really understand the value of providing meaningful language access. And it's including in that group a cross-functional um, cross-functional staff members, so making sure that you have folks from your frontline staff, you know, from uh, individuals from your hotline, maybe um, someone for, from your finance staff, or maybe a grant manager. So really being um, intentional about bringing together a core group of individuals who are going to help to um, not only um, 
develop a, a language access policy, but who are also those same people who are going to help get that organizational and individual buy-in, right? You'll want folks um, who are able to go back to their individual department, um, folks who will then go back and advocate for with others in the um, organization about creating that individual um, buy-in. So having part of this um, work group really does start to solidify some of that buy-in. If you're able to get, you know, five to six individuals from the organization to become part of that core work group, half of your battle is won in terms of buy-in. Your other um, way to get that organizational buy-in really is, is about pulling out the federal and legal requirements. You know, Title VI requires this. The Executive Order 13166 requires this. Those are other um, opportunities to create buy-in. Um, Jose Juan and I have um, worked with um, other organizations where we've held a webinar um, for um, leadership and um, management and kind of walked them through the importance of um, developing language access plan, what those federal requirements are, and why it's in their best interest to be able to do some of that work up front. Thanks, Amadi. Um, and the other question is, what is the best practice for hiring bilingual staff? So again, if folks can share their um, their responses on the chat box or chime in, what is the best practice for hiring bilingual staff? And I think this is kind of an interesting question because it goes back to, again, to what are the hiring practices of the organization? Are you looking for folks that can that have the skills and the knowledge, or are you looking for folks who have master degrees and licensures? Which, again, I have a master's degree. I, I went to higher ed and all of that. But I think part of it is, are you willing to invest in community, invest with advocates that do have the skills to communicate with diverse survivors of diverse communities, particularly around language access, um, to make that happen for survivors and make sure that they have the information and the op and understand the options that they are that they have at their disposal or able to engage so um let's see there seems to be a response here what is what if those in your organization feel like they are meeting those requirements but what they see as meaningful access and what you see as meaningful access looks different I'm trying to ask this incognito because I'm okay all right um Luma, do you want to take that Ooh, well, that's all relative, right? So I think that's why it's so important to be able to um, formalize your language access practices into a formal policy, right? Because you're right, in certain organizations, you know, some individuals might see what they're doing as sufficient, while others might not. And the way to kind of circumvent all of that really is about, you know, creating, again, a work group to help develop that language access plan. So for example, if your organization currently has a language access plan, it's really about bringing some of those individuals around a table to have the conversations around, this is our current language access plan, here is how we're currently providing language access services, and really spending some time having some conversations about, you know, what are the practices that we want to institutionalize? Because again, at the end of the day, when you're looking at providing meaningful language access, it's also about taking reasonable steps. And if, you know, if, if one staff member feels that, you know, um, using, I don't know, um, oh, I, would, I don't want to know. If, if, for example, if one individual decides that, you know, using a bilingual staff member is enough, right, while another individual feels that um, using an in-person interpreter interpreter is the best practice is really about figuring out how you come to terms and, and to agreement as to when both of those situations are appropriate right because for example you know you might in, in a situation where you have someone who's, who walks into your office seeking services it might be you know um, meaningful access at that point just to pull in a bilingual bicultural staff member who is able to help in that situation but if we're thinking about, you know, um, providing language access services to a victim in court, you know, then we know the best practice is actually hiring 
um, an in-person interpreter. So it's really looking at the opportunities or looking at this as an opportunity to bring folks to the table to really have those conversations where you're able to really identify what you're currently doing and what the organization feels is best practice for the organization. Because the reality is, is that what each one of those individuals are doing in terms of language access might be getting at providing reasonable steps toward language access. It's just figuring out, you know, under what situations do we do A and under what situations would we do B. But those are certainly internal conversations that need to be had. And a, and a way to go about doing that really is about, again, just bringing a, a group together and figuring out how you all might start working towards either enhancing your current plan or starting to develop your current plan. And for those of you who weren't um, weren't um, able to attend the webinar last week, last week we talked a bit about developing a language access plan and also our um, language access toolkit online does take you step by step and um, really does set the background and foundation for all the introspective work that needs to happen prior to embarking and developing your language access plan. So I think if you take a look at that, um, that might be helpful in terms of figuring out, you know, how do we get these, how do we bring folks to the table? Because part of that process is that introspective work really is about bringing a group together and looking at kind of really I'm doing some free thinking around um, some key questions that we posed in that second webinar, which are, for example, um, what are the benefits to increasing our language access services? Um, how important are the services that we currently provide to, you know, survivors or victims with limited English proficiency? Um, what are the costs to the organization as a whole for not having language access or not providing language access services? Um, what concerns do we have as an organization? So, for example, what concerns do we have in terms of what staff member A is doing over here and what staff member B thinks is the correct way to provide language access? So, again, it does um, provide you some of those opportunities to, to come together and to have those conversations. And, and to be honest, you know, the process of developing a language access plan is a collective process. It's not something that can you can just um, kind of task one individual with doing. It really has to be a collaborative effort where um, staff members from across the organization have a chance to come in, have some conversation, share some input, um, and really um, be able to be an integral part of that process. I hope that that helps to answer your question a bit. That's a tricky one there. Thanks, Amadi. And it kind of falls into the, the, you know, the process around these last two questions on this slide. What safeguards should be put into, should be put in place to make sure they are not used for services outside of their job description? And then what are ways bilingual advocates can explain and say no to being asked to do things outside of their job responsibilities? And this is kind of also a difficult question, um, which I think, again, goes back to <clears throat> organizational leadership um, and making sure that there is a clear understanding that just because you hire bilingual advocates uh, or bicultural or bilingual or biliterate advocates, they're not interpreters, which is a whole different level of expertise. So when you hire bilingual staff, they're there to provide communication or facilitate the communication from one language to another or perhaps use diverse forms of communication for certain individuals for, this, for the sake of the advocacy piece within the construct of the, the services that you're trying to provide or trying to explain to the survivor. Outside of that, really requires having experts who are certified interpreters um, to do that, 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 um, that service. Lamar, you wanna add, some, you wanna add more to this? Yeah, sure. And I think, you know, something that you had mentioned too um, earlier, Jose Juan, was really looking at your organizational practices, right, for hiring staff, period. Um, looking at what you're currently requiring in your job descriptions and what expectations are. And I think it gets tricky when we're talking about hiring bilingual, bicultural staff. Um, 
you know, I think a best practice is really looking at what the expectations are for that individual and really setting clear um, job descriptions um, and clear expectations. Um, you know, we know that, like Jose Juan mentioned, that utilizing bilingual staff as interpreters is not a best practice. Um, it is something, however, that we also understand to be um, a way of taking reasonable steps to providing uh, meaningful language access. We know that the reality for many organizations is that when we hire bilingual, bicultural staff, it is with the purpose that, you know, they have a specific skill set in, in a different language that, you know, both the organization and the community at large would benefit from. And it's being able to then distinguish exactly what those um, individuals' um, skill sets will be utilized for, right? So, like I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, if you have an advocate um, who answers a, a, a phone call and is able to help that individual in that individual's language, that certainly, yes, that, that is okay to do. You know, we know that that's the way of, of some organizations being able to provide language access services. Um, you know, if someone, you know, if a document needs to be translated, um, then yes, is it appropriate to utilize your, your bilingual, bicultural staff? Sure, as long as you've already indicated that in the job description that, you know, as part of their job description that it also might include some interpretation services for non-essential types of, of, um, of services or in crisis services at the moment. We're also looking at that or setting the expectation that some um, translation services might be needed from that individual, whether it's to, um, you know, develop a flyer or help um, translate a document. But also knowing that if you're doing that, then the expectation is, is how does, how do I as the organization who's hired a bilingual, bicultural staff, how do I then compensate that individual for this added skill set? So we'll, you'll, we'll see organizations that when we talk about um, having a best practice in hiring bilingual staff members really is about, again, setting those clear expectations, but also ensuring that bilingual staff are adequately um, compensated. Um, so that we see that there is a shift differential sometimes, and sometimes we'll apply that same differential or even a little bit larger differential for those individuals that we hire with a very specific um, language skill set. Um, you, you'll want to make sure that, you know, also what safeguards should be put in place to ensure that they're not used for services outside of their job. Again, I think that's a conversation um, that needs to be had um, with. Um, your HR department, the hiring manager, and the person who is being hired for that position. I think it's very critical when we're talking in terms of advocates to never put the advocate in a situation where the advocate has to be the advocate and the interpreter. So there might be situations in, in office or in meetings uh, with survivors where um, it's much easier to have the, the advocate interpret and be the advocate. But in situations that require um, engagement with law enforcement, if a report needs to be made or a report needs to be taken by law enforcement, you don't want to put your advocate in that situation of being an advocate and interpreter. Because at that point, the advocate can only do one or the other. And what we want at the, in that situation is for the advocate to be able to do her job or his job as an advocate and not as an interpreter. Also in a court situation, you know, we'll find judges will say, well, you have an advocate here, let the advocate interpret, interpret for, for the victim. And it's like, well, yes, but I'm here as the advocate, so I want to remain in my advocate role because again, if you're the interpreter, you can only interpret exactly what's being said back and forth. You don't have the opportunity to, you know, inform the um, the survivor what's happening. You're not even you're not able to provide guidance to the advocate to the um, survivor. So it's a, it's a very um, fine line, right? And it's, it's important for organizations then to be able to decipher and say, let's be clear, your job descriptions are these you know, over here and, you know, you might interpret within the office or out in community or, you know, in the, in the event that there's a crisis emergency and we just need to find out what's happening right now. But you're, you're not 
um, able to interpret in situations, you know, where you're being asked to be an interpreter for the survivor and between the survivor and law enforcement, or between survivor and a lawyer, or between survivor and a court, um, because there are mechanisms in place to both hold law enforcement and the courts accountable. Um, they all have access to a language line. There is not a court, I say, that I've come across yet that does not have access to language access um, via a telephonic interpretation line. Oftentimes, judges will say, oh, that's just too much of a hassle. I don't want to deal with it. Well, you know what? Either we deal with it or we have to delay the hearing until the court provides an in-person interpreter. And I think that's why it's really important for us as advocates to be able to really um, to really arm ourselves, right, with as much, um, as many tools and as much knowledge as possible so that not only are we able to advocate for what's right for survivors with limited English proficiency, but that we feel that we can advocate for ourselves when we're put in these situations where organizations or employers might expect certain levels of um, interpretation or translation from us as staff simply because we speak another language. Um, and I see that um, Haley had put here, that that's where the other duties is assigned, gets pulled in when trying to set those boundaries. Right, and I think, and, and, and you're very right, um, Haley, that happens all of the time. But I think also that, you know, we have a responsibility to as advocates that when we see, right, some of those things, or we see other duties as assigned, then it's kind of like, can we talk about that and what that looks like, right? Um, and then again, it's just, you know, having the awareness and the knowledge to be able to say, you know, best practice is that we do this, this, that, and the other. Otherwise, here are the repercussions that we can that that we can run into, or the things that the challenges that we might be able to run into. And if you're running into those situations um, at an employer with an organization, and you find it too challenging, or you find that you're not being heard, you know, certainly feel free to reach out. Reach out to Jose Juan or myself, um, um, Rosie, who is our director. Um, she she's been doing our language access, leading our language access work here at Casa for many many years. Um, you know there are ways that we can have a conversation with those that you know with those organizations just to let them know, hey, you know, um, yes, bilingual advocates have a place in terms of what their role should be, but here is where you're going to run into some some situations that'll be difficult if you put this, uh, advocates in, in, in those situations of being interpreters and translators. Thanks, somebody. Um, so moving on. Um, just some more questions, frequently asked questions that we receive. Often we find ourselves needing to make arrangements for language accessibility within limited time. So what are the steps and practices organizations should do to be accessible at the last minute? Does anyone would like to anyone, would anyone does anyone have an idea of what to do or maybe share a thought about what could those steps be in case you need to do last minute adjustments around language access? Which, again, this is something we already do on a daily basis. If you work at a crisis center and you do a lot of crisis intervention work, this is what we do on a daily basis. How often do things go according to plan when you schedule uh, a survivor or a person wanting to come in for an intake and things change, right? And so this is something we already do. It's just a matter of nuancing it based on the aspect around language access. Um, so one of the things you can do is always this is where your language access plan comes in. Once you have a language access plan, it'll give you step by step of what happens, whether it's a scheduled ahead of time, which often that doesn't happen. That's a luxury we have for those of us who work at a crisis center or who do this form of crisis work. Um, and also having an immediate plan in case you may have a survivor that comes in that's brought in either by law enforcement or family members or so on to the crisis center for some form of service. Um, and again, that's part of the language access plan. Do you have a list of interpreters that could be on the ready to provide language access? What is your protocol in, in case um, the bilingual advocate is not in the office? Because again, it goes back to is what Lumari and I have mentioned. It really is an organizational process taking accountability 
and not just because you hire a bilingual advocate or if you're lucky to hire several or a couple of bilingual advocates does not mean just because uh, when the, those bilingual advocates leave the office to do some sort of accompaniment or taking a client here or even take vacation, that the work stops, right? So what is your contingency plan in case that plan A doesn't work? And again, we do this on a daily basis. It's just a matter of nuancing it. Um, here, Daisy uh, shared have a list of community services that might provide interpreting services. Often universities may help, yes. So again, this is where the co-advocacy is so important, going outside of our organization, because again, bears repeating that as amazing as we are um, with our programs and, and, and all of that, the success of, of advocacy of, of survivors of sexual assault is based on the support of other community members in, in our neighborhoods, right? And that's not just um, focusing on or engaging the usual folks, which is criminal justice professional social service, but also looking at communities as well. Um, Lamadi, would like, anything else to add to this? Yeah, really quick, Hosewan. Um, I would say to that co-advocacy piece, um, you know, really be intentional and thoughtful about doing that. So, and when you're talking about reaching out to other community-based organizations to provide interpretation services, what we want don't want to do is um, how do I say this? We don't want to use other organizations for their expertise and their time. So part of when you're talking about co-advocacy cool and reaching out to, to other organizations, it really is about being mindful and thinking that process through ahead of time. Um, if it's gonna be part of your language access plan and part of how you do your work, it's important to be able to have conversations with those organizations, probably formalize a, a, a partnership by way of an MOU where the MOU um, indicates what are the um, expectations and what are the roles and responsibilities of engaging in co-advocacy work. I know for us as an organization, it's critical that when we find ourselves in those situations that we're able to compensate um, the other organization that we're working with uh, for their time and expertise. We never want to feel like we're using other organizations uh, we want to ensure that we're being um, thoughtful and intentional. I know um, we're a Latina organization based in St. Paul, Minnesota. The majority of our staff are Latinas, Latinos, bilingual, bicultural. And we also are a first come, first serve shelter. So oftentimes we find ourselves with individuals at shelter who are um, from the Somali community, uh, Laotian, um, from Laos. Um, from the Hmong community. And so we find ourselves, you know, oftentimes we don't have, well, we know we don't have advocates who speak those languages. Um, and we know that, you know, the language line is perfect for uh, an intake, for example, once um, a survivor comes to shelter. But what do we do on the daily? How do we communicate on a daily basis? How do we ensure that we're providing not just linguistically appropriate services, but also culturally appropriate services? And so in order to be able to do that, we've developed um, partnerships and we've um, also created MOUs with some of the other culturally specific community-based organizations in St. Paul to really ensure that when we have survivors or when they have survivors from our communities um, or when we have survivors from their communities that we're providing advocacy services to, is how do we do that together to ensure that that individual, that client is getting the best service available and that the services that they're receiving are both culturally responsive and linguistically appropriate. And again, it really is about looking at how do we, um, how do we formalize those partnerships in a way that are um, equitable and reciprocal in nature so that no one, so that everyone involved is being compensated for their time and energy. And what I'm saying about compensated, sometimes when you're doing the MOU, that compensation is reciprocal. So it would be in kind. Right, but you want to you want to stipulate that and you want to state that in a written document so that all is clear. Sometimes you know we'll sign MOUs with individuals and offer to compensate them at a specific rate for their time and expertise, whether it's providing um, last minute um, language access interpretation, um, especially for those languages of lesser diffusion. And what I mean by that is those languages that are difficult to find interpreters for. 
um, because in these situations where it's last minute, you might be able to find, you know, a, a Spanish speaking interpreter that might be able to come within four hours or, you know, or at least 24 hours is what most um, interpretation services offer. But if it's a language like um, Arabic or, um, you know, Somalian, um, if there's a small community, that means there may or may not be uh, interpret, interpreter services available. So you might, in that situation, have to reach out to a local um, Somali servant organization or a Somali culturally specific community based organization to help provide some of those services for you. Um, in the next question here in a previous webinar, you all mentioned working with community partners to reach language accessibility needs. Can you share? ways to work equitably with community partners and what does that look like and i think that you know um co-advocacy addresses some of that in terms of again having some conversations sitting down developing an mou looking at what um expectations and roles and responsibilities will look like for each organization whether you all would um, compensate each other financially or would you compensate each other um, in kind with in-kind donations of your time and expertise and then uh, last here on uh, what forms of cross training for interpreters and tra uh, translators do you all recommend and I think for us, um, when uh, we were developing our own language access plan, something that we did was we were very clear in our vetting process. Uh, when, um, when I was interviewing um, interpretation services, I basically started with a list of interpretation services in the St. Paul, Minneapolis area, and essentially called them one by one. And I had, you know, five, six questions that I would ask of each. Basically, you know, what languages do you provide services for? What is your turnaround time? Um, how much do you charge for your services? Is it a one hour, you know, an, an hourly rate? Is it a two hour rate? How soon can you get someone here? And then uh, I would follow it up with, and if we were to contract with you, here's what we would want. We would want to come in and train your staff on domestic violence, sexual assault, trauma-informed approaches and practices, and then um, also self-care. And so it's really important that when you're vetting interpreters that you also think about the interpreters themselves. Oftentimes we find ourselves in situations where interpreters have never really interpreted for a victim of sexual assault so, or a victim of DV, and they don't have the necessary language, right? And so we want to provide training on sexual assault and domestic violence, not only to give the language, but also to familiarize individuals with what, you know, domestic violence and sexual assault is. We also want to be very mindful and very intentional because we don't know what the lived realities of those interpreters are. And so we don't want to cause any harm and we don't want to trigger anyone. And we want to ensure that whatever um, interpreters are sent to work with our clients, that they have some sort of understanding and background of DV, that um, they're aware that you know they're going to be um, interpreting some very difficult situations, that they're going to, um, and these situations are situations that need to be um, interpreted exactly how they're being presented by the victim, and that those situations might be very triggering for those individuals. So, you know, so figuring out how do we provide training to um, interpreters, letting them know of what triggering is, you know, how they can be triggered, how they can provide and um, self-care for themselves in those situations. Um, we've seen um, and we've heard many examples of interpreters who, for example, um, do not feel comfortable um, interpreting certain um you know, um, certain terms and terminology. Um, you know, if a woman says, for example, you know, um, vagina, the interpreter not feeling comfortable might end up describing something similar to what the victim is saying. So providing some training on the importance of being able to um, describe exactly what survivors are saying and actually being able to use the correct terminology for some of that. So when you're thinking about 
um, interpreters and vetting for interpreters, you'll want to look at that. And then you'll always want to look to see if you can find a certified interpreter. Um, they're not they're not readily available in every in every area. Um, but it's important um, that if you can find a certified interpreter, that, that you go with them. Oftentimes, you'll find them for languages that are most commonly spoken. Um, and um, also the translators, um, really looking at, you know, asking them to see examples of work that they've done in the past. You want to make sure that they have an understanding of who you are as an organization, what your philosophical views are, and also um, that they're aware of the language that you utilize, right, uh, in terms of describing your work, um, you know, um, the neutrality uh, of the language that you might use, that that's communicated in ways that they understand um that are important to you as an organization hiring them for services i think those are all very critical steps when you're thinking about um cross training for interpreters and translators thank you Ramadi. and we have a question here on the chat box um someone we've talked about court language access does this differ when interacting with law enforcement and they're basically saying they've had some um, they're working with a, a survivor and they've had some challenges with law enforcement being unable to provide access to serve to the service yeah no uh, on uh, law enforcement agencies fall under the same exact um, legal requirement they all receive federal funding every law enforcement agency in this country receives some sort of federal funding. And so off, um, a lot of language, um, what I've seen with a lot of law enforcement agencies is that they have a language access plan. So oftentimes, um, you know, the language access plan was delivered, was um, developed, you know, 10 years ago, and no one knows that it exists, but everybody knows that you have access to the language line, either via, via dispatch or they can dial the language line themselves. Um, in that language access plan, what happens is that oftentimes the language access plans are policies that are very general and not always um, not always very specific to the agency. So a lot of law enforcement agencies, um, from the experience that I have, um, tend to uh, obtain their policies through LexisNexis which is an, an organization that provides a lot of a law enforcement policies to different agencies and language access policies is one of them. And so oftentimes, you know, they'll obtain that language access policy. Um, law enforcement officers may not ever be trained on those policies. And so what happens is that, you know, they'll act as if, you know, they'll act as if they can't provide those services. But you have the same recourse with law enforcement um, agencies themselves, you can ask to see their language access plan. Folks should have language access plans readily available. If not, they should be available on their um, on their um, their agency's website. And in those language access plans, it should state that they should, they they are responsible for providing language access services to both individuals with limited English proficiency and individuals um, with deaf who are deaf or hard of hearing. And if you run into those situations and you continue to get pushback from law enforcement, you know, reach out to someone and let them know. Let them know. And you can also let them know that, you know, they're denying access to services to individuals. Um, I can give you a, a prime example on um, the case of Daisy Garcia and the NYPD. Um, uh, Daisy was an individual limited English proficiency who um, had sought out law enforcement services uh, three, four, or five times. She actually went to um, the police department to file reports on three occasions. Um, since she was monolingual speaking, um, she filed her uh, reports in Spanish. The NYPD uh, failed to have those um, reports translated into English. And by that fact alone, no follow-up was ever done with Daisy in terms of what was happening in her situation. Um, her husband um, killed her and her two daughters, and after her death, her family found copies of those police reports, and um, they brought them forth 
to the police department. They brought them forth to some local agencies in New York City. And um, they filed a lawsuit against the NYPD. And I want to say last year, the year before last, the organizations won that lawsuit that the NYPD failed to provide language access services, adequate language access services. So when you find yourself in those situations where law enforcement, where they're not providing language access services, two things. Um, under the Civil Rights Act and the executive order, the executive order, again, it's about everybody has to have a language access plan. Um, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act is more pertinent and refers more to spoken language, where the ADA is, um, is where the uh, services for deaf and hard of hearing individuals fall under. And everybody is, um, has to abide by the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so you have those three tools in your toolkit where you're able to say, law enforcement agency, I know that it's, you're federally required to provide language access services, and, and they have to. I mean, it, they, they have to get it done. And you can also mention that if, you know, if you're not going to provide services, then, you know, we can take it upon ourselves to file a complaint with the DOJ. And granted, the, the complaint with the DOJ will take some time to be investigated and addressed and all of that. That is also a way of holding individuals accountable, helping people understand that this is happening. Um, if you continue to run into those issues, certainly reach out to us. Um, we can certainly make one phone call, two phone calls, um, talk to some individuals, and, and help them understand what their responsibilities are around language access provision. Because again, oftentimes law enforcement agencies have the language access plans. They just never get trained. So law, I've come, I've worked with too many law enforcement off, um, agencies where Patrol hasn't been trained on language access. Managers, detectives haven't been trained on language access. So for them, oftentimes, again, it's the practice of having access to the language lines. But when it comes to providing services to the deaf or hard of hearing community, um, they're challenged even more by that. But yet, it's still the responsibility to, to do so. And it's our, also our responsibility to, to hold them accountable for that. Thank you, Ramadi. So um, I think that's it. Um, we're coming close to an end of our time. So I just want to give another opportunity for folks if we have any last minute questions, um, that anything came up, or if you don't want to ask or you want to have an offline conversation, you're certainly welcome to reach out to us. Uh, Lumadi and I are available to have further conversations around these issues. And as you've all experienced, um, this is not an easy situation. Certainly, it does require a lot of collaboration, a lot of discussion, and also defining what is priority around safety and access for survivors of sexual assault or sexual violence in your communities. And it really goes back to having a lot of internal dialogues as an organization deciding to do this and then having some co advocacy collaborations with other partners around your communities and finding what are your resources and working with what you got, um, which sometimes you have more than what you think you do. So if there are no uh, questions, I want to thank again Wendy and Tasa for inviting us, Casa Esperanza National Latino Network, to do this webinar series. This is a, an issue that is very important to us as an organization, and it's also a very um, important topic of discussion and advocacy across the country so we're so you're not the only one dealing with some of these challenges in your own communities this is something that we encounter on a daily basis across the country uh, but there has been communities where they have coalesced they have developed a coordination they have developed co-advocacy and they figured it out i mean there are definitely um, what we call mentor courts across the country they have figured out how to provide language access and prioritizing that when it comes to certain situations um, as, as it relates to survivors of sexual assault or domestic violence in the court system, as well as there are other model practices or best practices um, in other crisis centers that have uh, implemented a language access plan successfully, um, but um, it, it came down to the accountability and responsibility of the organization as a whole and not just putting the burden solely on the bilingual advocate or advocates that they hire. Um, 
So again, thank you very much to everybody for your time and um, and participating in this webinar series. As I mentioned before, however, we we may be able to be of service. Please let us know. Wendy, again, Tasa, thank you so much for allowing us the space to have this dialogue with folks. And I appreciate it. Tasa appreciates it. I, I have to give a shout out to Denise Loya for getting in contact with you all to provide this. So thank you all very much. I appreciate your willingness to share, your willingness to continue to be a resource, and for working through all the little tech difficulties that we had. I appreciate it. So if anybody has any other questions, either talk them in or chat them in while I start finishing up here, just please be aware of, of some housekeeping. You will receive an email in about an hour after this webinar is terminated that um, or closed that will have an evaluation in it along with the a uh, link to the PowerPoint and a link to the uh, certificate of attendance for today's webinar. Please fill out the evaluations and send them back. You like what you hear here? I kind of feel like I'm doing a, you know, a, a grant, a fun drive for the PBS. <laughs> but if you, we work off of grants, and so if you like what you hear, your feedback is really important to tell our funders how important it is for you. Thank you so much for today's um, participation. Um, Jose Juan and Lumadi, thank you so very, very much. I will be in touch with you shortly. And uh, everybody, hopefully spring is right around the corner. Thank y'all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Wendy.